Hey there, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for being here. The channel has one goal in mind, to make you a better performer and entertainer or the best one possible. I'm Adam. I'm Felix. And we want to thank you for spending some time here. As always, none of these videos are monetized. The only advertising we'll do is if you like what we're doing here and you want to support us, head over to vulpinecreations.com. Check out the magic we have there to offer. And that's it. Let's dive right into the book club. Felix, what chapters are we diving into today? All right, Adam, thank you very much. This week we are diving into chapter five and six. So we are tackling two chapters for this week because we try to change up the format a bit and, and discuss more content in a shorter period of time. So it's easier digestible for you without leaving everything out what could be interesting and, and uh, could have benefit to your performance. So this week we are tackling five and six. Chapter five has the title, How Music Adds Interest, basically revisiting some of the points of last week's chapter plus a bunch of new ideas. And then for chapter six, we are tackling the topics of rhythm, youth, and sex appeal. Great, so we'll start with the music. Um, talking about that, like you said, he is sort of um, touching on what we've already spoken about, which is really the importance of music and how that can add drama, tension, uh, set the mood for your performance. And he has some good insight, diving a little deeper on it. The first chapter we talked about last week was really more about you should. If you're not, you should because it's important. This chapter is a little more about how, how do you, you know? Um, there was a really cool topic that he touched on, which I think is imperatively important. And I was just having this conversation with my girlfriend. I heard a, a piece of music from a rapper um, and I loved the, the music. The first two minutes of the song, there was no words. It was just a cool beat. And then the last minute of that song is him rapping. And I thought, oh man, what a cool way to start a show. So they've come in, they've sat down, and this is my three minutes before the show starts. Mm. And this chapter brings a good uh, piece of, of knowledge to that thought. You know, I love this music. There's no swears, it's not offensive rap or anything like that. But inherently, I'd probably ostracize, ostracize half my audience, that people just don't like rap. So they hear that beat, they hear the tone, and then they start hearing rap lyrics. Well, I've just started the show before I've come out by alienating half of the audience, where they go, oh man, is this whole show gonna be a rap show? Uh, just because I love it, doesn't mean everybody loves it. So Felix, right. he gives a couple pieces of advice where he was talking about playing music for different demographics. If you wanna touch on that, do you remember yeah, what sure. the number one um, type of music that all demographics, at least that they interviewed liked? Do you remember what he said there? No, I do not. But wait a second. Patriotic music. So patriotic basically, music. <laughs> everybody there agreed that they enjoyed patriotic music, right? right. So yeah. um, whatever country you're in or, or, um, or city you're in, that's a good thing to think about. Now, again, that can quickly sort of make the audience think this show is about the United States or, or patriotism. But it doesn't have to be the national anthem or something like that, but something that is uniformed, agreed upon in your country as a good song, mm -hmm. that might be a good way to say, hey, everybody likes this. But what other insights did he have on uh, music as far as talking to dem different demographics and what demographic liked what? Yeah, the interesting choice is that it underlines not only the point that you need to update your performance to modern standards in comparison with rock shows, theater or cinema, uh, but also that when you market to a specific demographic, when you know who your people are, you should use music, uh, music you should use music which is not only strengthening your performance and emphasizing those bits into, in your performance which uh, are reveals or something like that, just to strengthen those, but also appeal to the audience in itself so you can strengthen the overall experience for your, for your audience and spectators. Absolutely. A uh, great example would be in, in, in my corporate show, there's no words in any of the music on purpose, right? I don't want mm -hmm. the words to distract the audience and I don't want something to be said that maybe they're thinking about or they don't agree with, but it is lighthearted but energetic music, right? It's, it would be very hard to say, hmm, I don't like this music. And mm -hmm. that's the corporate show. Whereas in a theater show where I'm having people pay money, they buy a ticket and they come watch it, all of my marketing material Everything they see to lead them to that show has a different theme or a different feel. It's a little edgier. So that theater show might be a good place for me to use this intro of hip hop. 
where mm -hmm. they knew what they were getting into, right? They knew what kind of show it would be. It's not as if their boss said, we're going to go watch a magician for the holiday party. They've paid yeah. money because they know me, my branding, and what this show that I've put in front of them is supposed to be representing. So Do really you choose knowing- a specific song for your entrance, which you use over and over, so it be it becomes part of your brand? Like for example, when you when you watch a, a Darren Brown special, there is this, 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 I don't know what's this, it's a xylophone or something like that. Some, yeah. some, some toyish sounding uh, instrument, yeah. music playing, uh, and it's in every show. So when you hear it, you, would, you associate it with Darren Brown and his, in his uh, spectacular theater show. Do you do, sure. do you the same? I don't. I did try once to have somebody write me a song. Uh, I got mm -hmm. on uh, Upwork and it just turned out really cheesy, so I never used it. Um, You know, and the, the, the reason I would step away from that is that I don't have, I'm still learning, I'm still figuring it out, right? So I don't have a Darren Brown set in stone character where mm -hmm. I think it would, it would resonate through. I think it's a great idea, you know, to have this sort of call line or call tag or noise that uh, um, people just resonate with you as the magician. It's just not something I've done. I think if it was done well, you know, those jingles on commercials that, You hear it once and it's like, well, I'll have that for the rest of my life. It'd be mm -hmm. great to have some sort of opening like that. Um, that the beginning of the show, maybe towards the end of the show, it, it follows you through the show. And it's like your call tag, but it's easy for the audience to remember. I think that's yeah. a great idea. It's just not something I've, I've ever uh, tried to do with, with any great mm -hmm. success. Yeah, okay. I mean, another great example he brings is to use um, music before your show even starts. He has this example where um, he's, they, they prepared a magic show in the theater and in the entrance hall in the foyer there was a barkeeper and some, some other magicians doing little tricks for the audience. So when they arrive they can get into the moods, they can, they can uh, get at ease and their mind can prepare themselves to see something incredible in a couple of minutes. There they used uh, lower pace uh, nostalgic music just to, to bring the audience into the specific mood with the, uh, with the um, premise in mind that it would leverage the overall experience of the evening. Mm. So if people come to, come to your show, come to your theater, go uh, give away their coat and ran into the room to sit down in front of a chair, it takes the first couple of effects to get their head into the magic show. Yeah. And this would, this would take away from your entrance, it would, be, it would make uh, it more difficult to win the audience over and, and so many other things. And with, with this prelude, If you can, I don't know if it's the right word, but if, yep. with, this, with this prelude, uh, you could ease it up and make the overall experience even stronger. Yeah, I mean, if you looked at Cirque du Soleil and go watch any one of their shows, there's about 10 minutes before the show that you go through this experience before the show. And that works with music, but also visual, right? So if yep. you have a theater, why not set your theater up from the moment they walk in the door to start inspiring that that feeling of wonder and that we're going on this journey together and Cirque du Soleil does it extremely well you have to walk through almost like a maze to get to the stage or the seating area and as mm -hmm. you start walking through that everything starts to feel real weird and trippy and it puts you in the mindset of what you're going into before you even go into it so mm -hmm. you, we can do that as, as magicians as well and that could be as simple as the music like Felix said before the show right something to set the mood from when they're getting their drinks or mingling with their friends before walking in. And almost all good theater shows I've ever been to for magicians do that. When you're standing in the foyer, you're checking your coat, you're getting your bag, waiting for your friends, something is playing that is going to ring true to the show or at least get you ready for the show. I've even seen where you walked in and the announcer is saying, hey, you know, you're about to experience a magic show like anything, you've, like nothing you've ever seen. All we're asking is for you to uh, suspend your disbelief for the next hour and 15 minutes. And they're basically telling you this is how you should feel before you walk in the door. Um, there's some music in the background, but that's a very strong tool that's uh, usually underutilized. And I understand why. Most performing environments I'm in, I don't have the luxury of a foyer and being yeah. able to control the music. But when you grow into that, let's say you're doing a cruise show or a theater show, These are things that you really should consider because we're elevating it from uh, a banquet hall, you know, 
to a theater show, well, what's that elevation? Is it just that the scenery is different or is it that you've got at your, your disposal tools like a foyer playing music to inspire the mood and all the lighting set to the way you want? When we graduate into these bigger theaters and bigger venues, we have the ability to use these things. It's just a lot of performers don't because they never have yeah. or they're nervous or they don't know how. If you've mm -hmm. got the ability to use it, use it. Use every tool at your advantage, uh, to your advantage that you've got in the venue in the space, right? If you're doing a but, corporate, go ahead. Um, there was one performer we watched of his virtual show together, uh, Luke Jamey. Yeah, Luke pronounce Jermaine. His name correctly. Yeah, Luke Jermaine. Um, he had this little video at the, right at the beginning of his virtual show. So even if you don't have a theater, I think he did this incredibly well with this video because it, catchy visuals, cool music, and he had a voiceover explaining what the whole theme is going to be all about. And I remember the both of us, we were connected via, via Zoom and watching the show together. It was so romantic. Uh, but um, we were both like, it is actually pretty smart. And, and we really, really liked this entrance. And when he then yeah. ripped this paper and the show started, it was a very, very good and very, very well executed uh, piece of introduction, which you can control 100%. <laughs> the only thing I you have it's... to do is make the video and, and play it. Right. And for virtual, that's very, very smart because we're not, yeah. we can't see if they're sitting down or if they're in the kitchen making their coffee. Um, you yeah. know, so that's a good cue for them to go, oh, shoot, this, the show started without them missing too much of it. But it's yeah. the same idea, right? It's using everything at his disposal to better the experience for the audience. And music just falls into that, right? Um, mm -hmm. A few important takeaways I gathered from it were what you said already, know your audience, know that while you might like a, a song or some music, it doesn't mean everyone in the audience does. And the argument may be, well, it's my show, it should be things that fit me. And that's mm -hmm. great, and I, I can, I can get on board with that, except for the fact that you have to realize your show is there to entertain all of the different personalities that are in the audience. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just because you like something doesn't mean it's going to better your show. It might feel better to you, but it doesn't necessarily mean it'll be a more enjoyable viewing experience for your audience. If somebody despises hip hop music, and you play hip hop music to start your show, you put it off in a bad, um, you've started the show on a wrong foot. And hip hop is one of those things that a lot of people just hate. Same with country. If you start your mm -hmm. show with a country song, you're, you're gonna alienate a lot of your audience. Whereas instrumentals that have a good rhythm, a good beat that aren't overpowering and don't seem like they're uh, at a rave or something, those are pretty palpable for almost everybody in the audience. So just yeah. know that, right? Know that your job is to set the atmosphere and to play to everybody in the audience. So figure out what's the least offensive music, what's the most uh, easy for everyone to listen to. That's why elevator music is usually pretty standard across the board. Hotels don't want you getting in their elevator and hearing something that's gonna offend or upset you. So they play a pretty boring type of music and it's not it's not that they want to be boring and old school. It's that they want something playing that's going to be very hard to offend or upset or make an, uh, a potential client feel uneasy. And we should I think mean, in the same regards. I mean, a good tip on this point would be to use uh, those um, free, uh, not free, but, but free to use music platforms like, for example, Epidemic Sound, Artlist, or all those other, other uh, platforms you can, you can get free, royalty-free music from. Sure. Um, the cool thing is you can, we, we're not sponsored by these brands, by the way, in, in any way. I don't know if we have to say it, but I, I dropped those brand names and just to be sure. But um, what you can do is you can sh search music by mood, mood, tempo and duration. And uh, when you piece your show together or your routine together, you could uh, very specifically look for a specific kind of music, theme of music, mood on, or, in, or even instruments. And they're all, always um, only instrumental versions as well. So it's a great you idea. Can get a, get the rid of mood all filter these. is really good, um, yeah. right? What mood do I want this piece of magic to feel like? Um, yeah. And search moods. You know, one mm -hmm. other thing we didn't talk about, which we probably should address, is royalty free or not. You know, it's technically illegal for you to go into a theater and play um, a Beatles song, right? You don't own the rights to that. A lot of times you'll get away with it. 
But keep in mind, if you spend a month scripting out the, the music for your show and you show up to a theater where they say, oh, I, you know, we can't play that here. We don't have the copyright. They won't allow you to play it. And I've been in that situation before. So mm -hmm. just know that, you know, 90% of the shows you do, you'll be fine with any and all music you choose. 10% of the shows, they won't let you. They'll, you know, especially yeah. if it's a venue that does a lot of concerts and a lot of shows like your theater venues, they're a lot more strict because they're the ones who are getting a huge fine. If by some chance there's a record label person in there that goes, you can't play hmm. this. So yeah. keep it in mind, right? Um, the best and easiest thing to do is use all copyright free uh, music, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Write your show out with music that is free to use. Also, there are some places where you can buy theater music, right? Go search for um, scores for a theater, theater performance and you can mm -hmm. purchase rights to it. So I don't want to dwell on it too long. I'll be honest, almost all my shows use some sort of music that have copyright claims. But if I'm ever doing a theater show, I know that going into it and I eliminate that just to first, it makes you look more professional. So you don't show up and the event coordinator going, wait, why are you using Ice Ice Baby? We can't, we don't have the rights to that. You as a performer should know that. But yeah. in corporate settings and things like that, a banquet hall at a, at a hotel, use what you see fit. That's my advice. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, usually theaters or concert halls have this, have this skill down quite, quite uh, professionally. So when, when I was playing in bands on, as a hobby, uh, we always had to hand in our set lists so they can check for any cover songs or whatever so they don't run into difficulties with royalties. Using songs from platforms like mentioned beforehand would mean you always get a certificate Uh, with every song you download, just put them into a folder, send them to the to the event hall, and basically say, "Okay, this is the music I'm going to play." Uh, just to be, just to give you a heads up, this is what you can expect. If you see any difficulties, now is the time to speak up, or not five minutes for the show. Yeah, or realize that during your show you won't have your music, you know, yeah. and, and that could change the the feel of the show dramatically. So, Absolutely. you know, again. This chapter, chapter five, emphasizing the importance of music, talking a little bit about timing and pacing of it, um, what to use uh, before the show starts, things of that nature. But again, just really emphasizing the importance of music and factoring that into a real part of your show. Your show's mm -hmm. not just your script and your tricks. It's the overall atmosphere. What does the scene in the background look like? What does the music sound like? So we're really stressing the importance of music Like we've said before, if you're just building a show and you've yet to, great. Now you can start where you should and go, where do I put my music in? It becomes a little more difficult when you've got a show you've done a hundred or a thousand times and then you have to start thinking about implementing music. But if that's the position you're in, can't stress enough, it will make your show better, significantly better. Yeah. And it's not a lot of work. You know, you take a week or a month of really just figuring out the bells and whistles and now you've got a show that is much stronger, much more engaging and figuring out how to use the magic to or use the music to emphasize the magic. And once you start getting a rhythm of that, it's a really cool feeling. You'll feel your show being more impactful. Mm -hmm. And uh, for people starting out, my experience with keynotes, I think we, we touched on this point again um, beforehand. Um, if you're nervous and if you are more likely to rush, with your presentation, your speech, or your performance when you're nervous, music could give you a beat where yep. you can perform to. And you can always check if you're in line with your music or not. Yep, that's how great dancers do it. Figure yep. skaters and everything, they know if I don't land the minute that beat drops, then I'm off timing and I either have to speed up or slow down. So it's a great cue to know where you are in the performance as well. And this is um, a perfect segue to the next chapter because the first uh, the first point Fitzky points out is rhythm. And rhythm is the experienced pace of your show. He is referring to that uh, it's, even, it, it's one of the biggest selling points in music. So good beat can get your blood rushing and, and you can get more and more excited. Uh, but also the overall pacing of your show. Like for example, if you watch um, groups like the Blumen Group or uh, what's it, Cirque du Soleil, whatever, Stomp, Stomp was also quite huge. Not really yep. music, but used 
um, unusual, unusual items as instruments and created a, a wall of sound with the stage show and everything was very, very impactful. That's why they were yeah. so famous at this point. And when we talk about, you know, scripting out your show and building a show, that's what we're talking about is the rhythm of it. If you come out and you do three seven minute pieces of magic to start your show, that's a terrible rhythm, right? It's mm -hmm. seven minutes, applause, seven minutes, applause. Whereas if you did a 30 second piece of magic followed by a three minute piece, then a seven minute piece, then a one minute piece, now the audience has this rhythm, this flow, and it's not this stop, start, stop, yeah. start. So when you pair that with music on top of it, then you've got a really nice flow of events um, and rhythm, even in your talking, right? Monotone mm -hmm. speakers who speak the same length at the same speed throughout their whole speech are almost impossible to listen to. Uh, if you go down Audible and listen to people who are the authors of their book that try and read the Audible themselves, mm -hmm. it's like pulling teeth to listen to. It's, it's almost unbearable. Um, all of that, everything we do on stage has rhythm. How do you walk on stage? Do you do it rhythmically or do you do it robotically? How do you move around the stage? Is it mm -hmm. with rhythm and timing and pace or is it clumsy and stumbling through things? How do you speak to your audience? Is it all in one language with one monotone across the board? Or are you pausing when you need to and raising your voice or lowering your voice or even the volume of your voice? All of these things add rhythm and texture to your show. Mm -hmm. um, rhythm, I think he's stressing being the most important, right? Yeah. We want a rhythmic, I mean, life is about rhythm and harmony. So we wanna script our show, our music, our, our movements, everything about the show should have a nice rhythm to it. And that's the importance of watching your show back. When you're on stage in the zone, a lot of that stuff goes out the wayside. You don't even think about it until the adrenaline is worn down. It's been a couple days and then you can sit back looking at your show. You'll really quickly see, does this feel rhythmic or does it feel stale? Mm -hmm. Like I'm missing something. And if it feels yeah. like I didn't screw any tricks up, I nailed my speech or, or my script, but it still feels off, there's a good chance that your rhythm is off. And really look at it. How long are the pieces? How long do you talk without a break? A laugh break, an applause break? And if an so, in that, what's that? An interaction with the audience in whatever exactly. form. Exactly. It's, you know, rhythm is a, is a tough thing to teach. It, it, it's one of those things that you'll learn through experience. And that experience means re-watching your show by yeah. yourself, see what doesn't feel right, what doesn't flow, and then with somebody you look up to. So maybe you have a mentor or a magician that you've always thought was a great performer on stage. It can't hurt to shoot them an email and ask for a favor and just say, hey, mm -hmm. would you mind watching the first 10 minutes of my show and tell me if you think the rhythm of the show needs improvement? So you're not asking them to critique your whole show because that's a lot of work and people get paid to do that. But just a heartfelt email saying, I'm really trying to work on the rhythm and the delivery of my show. Would you mind watching my first effect and let me know if you think my rhythm and timing needs help. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about doing the work, right? Not just building it, but refining it and perfecting it over time. One, one good example for rhythm and synchronizing movement and visuals in, in a cohesive, harmonious concept is the movie Baby Driver from Edgar Wright. The cool. entry scene, the whole entry scene is paced to um, and synchronized to the beat of the music. They're, they're playing a 70s rock song and even the windscreen wipers of the car, the, the, the motion of chewing gum, every step, opening a door, closing a door, switching gears while the, while the chase scene, everything is in sync. And if this is just an absolute masterpiece and it goes on for seven minutes or something like that and you can only stare at it in awe because it's, 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 such, it's such a wonderful experience to, to, to see that. Everything cool. in there, everything. I mean, really, every single thing. If When you are down to a point where windscreen wipers are synced to the hi-hat of a drum set, I think you made your point in this, in yeah. this world. <laughs> yeah, and imagine watching a, a magician do that, right? Yeah. Where every step they step on stage hits the beat. And then when they pull the deck of cards out, maybe there's a snare that hits. Is that a lot of work? Hell yeah. That's a ton of work to do mm -hmm. and to do right.
But I can guarantee you an audience watching that as opposed to someone watching the exact same show without that thought, yeah. the first audience is going to get a much better show. They're going to remember it much more. And it might be something they don't even pay attention to, but internally they feel it, right? They might yeah. not know that you purposely did this. Some people will, but those are the people who are really attentive and maybe have studied theater or video. Um, it's not easy to do, but you know, d developing just, an incredible just show think is of, not easy. of video editing. If you watch a YouTube clip, every the majority of, of all good editors, uh, basically all good editors, cut to the beat of the music, right? So yeah. when a snare hit, when a bass a bass drum hit or something occurs, then they switch from one visual or camera angle to the next one. If there is only a, if if there are only slight delay, and it's constantly over and over again, the video becomes extremely hard to watch. Yeah, and extremely hard to watch. You wouldn't notice it. Um, uh, on the, you only notice it on the surface, but it starts to bug you over and over time. Yeah. Cool. I mean, I think that's that's rhythm. And um, with we can go back to to one thought of those. What, what are what are uh, trademarks of a good show? No access lines. No fumbling. And this comes all down to to being in in sync with the rhythm of your performance. Yeah. And, and sort of to close off uh, this week's book book study, uh, you know, we, he talks about sex appeal, um, youth, and, and all these things. Now, again, we're going to reiterate that this is an older book. This was written many, many, many years ago when most magicians had a beautiful assistant in a scadly, you know, dressed outfit and things of that nature. So what does he touch on briefly? He says, look, have a sexy assistant. Uh, make sure that it's sexy, but not offensive. Uh, Felix and I talked about this at length. At the end of the day, times have drastically changed, okay? The meat of what he's trying to say is youthful performers, a 25-year-old guy with great skin or woman with great skin is inherently more appealing to an audience, okay? So mm -hmm. I'm a 40 plus year old performer. I have bags under my eyes. My skin isn't as elastic as it used to be, you know? So how do I, wh what do I do in this scenario? Well, first of all, I'm not gonna come out as if I'm a 25 year old, you know, Don Juan, very sexy uh, uh, performer. I'm gonna maybe put some makeup on my face that will eliminate some of the bags or, you know, some of the, the, the wrinkles in your skin. But know your, it all comes back to know your character, right? Know who you are. And if you're 55 years old and you look as such, then don't come out trying to be a 25 year old suave performer. Maybe yeah. you were when you were 25, but times change. Your character will have to change as well. Look at uh, the great Kresgen, right? There's 60 plus years old and he looks very old and he's on stage completely devouring that as a character. Yeah. So you fall in love with the guy because he's not trying to hit on the girls and be sexy and smart and things of that nature. He's just a weathered performer who's been around the block that will blow your socks off because he's done this his whole life. And that's yeah. his character. So does he wear makeup? Of course. Does he have an assistant? In some of his shows, he may, right? He, they're just, I think the emphasis he's trying to make is at the end of the day, look as good as you can on stage and know your character. I don't agree with the idea of having a sexy assistant that winks at the audience and blinks at the right time. And if you're that kind of magician that has assistants, then do your diligence and study what should they wear? What action should they do on stage? Because they're another part of your show, which means the rhythm and the flow has to be on point. So don't dress them so offensively that anyone in the audience is going to be like, wow, that I can't even look at that. But also, you know, dress them to fit the character. If their character is your beautiful assistant, find a good looking woman, dress her appropriately and, and fill that void. But I don't I don't think we're going to spend too much time on the topic because n neither of us use beautiful assistants in our show. And most of the people who do probably have better advice on how to pick them than, than we do. And I'm not sure the advice in chapter six is as relevant today as it was when it was mm. written. So you're probably better off exactly. finding that advice from somebody who's doing it today. Exactly. I couldn't, I couldn't put it in better words. Just to, to give another example of what you said, no, your character um, is two, perform two musical performers uh, from uh, musicians. 
uh, one Robbie Williams and one being Eric Clapton. Uh, the beginning of the 2000s, both were on, on very big tours, right? Eric Clapton was all around the globe playing Hyde Park and so on. And Robbie Williams was, was quite huge with, uh, I think the, the songs were rock DJ and all this, those other things in his, in his high times. And uh, I bought both concert DVDs because I was interested in how they, they are building up their show and, and, and all of that from, from a standpoint of a musician. And the very first thing I saw when, uh, when Robbie Williams started his concert, he was, he was rocking a, a, a tall mohawk, basically half naked, heads down, being, being lowered to the stage in a, in a reversed cross figure. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's, that's probably a bit much. Uh, I mean, he's a, he's a very good performer, he's a very good singer, but uh, uh, it didn't get me. But then on the other thing, uh, on the other, other DVD, um, Eric Clapton came on stage in a black leather jacket, um, jeans, looked like, looked like a, a teacher, more or less, played the first note and everybody freaked out. And you, in, in this note you could hear, I don't know, 30 plus years of experience <laughs> without fancy lights and smoke and, and all of the other things Rob Williams was, was relying on to get the people excited for his music. Yeah. And it, I'm not saying Rob Williams is not a good performer. He is. He's a very good singer. He's, he's also had his flight time. Everything's great. He's not, he's, he's, he has not made his name in this, in this very, very harsh industry for no reason. But the experience of watching the first note of Eric Clapton in comparison to the other thing, it was like, yeah. And it's Bro. knowing your audience too, <laughs> yeah. right? Robbie Williams knows a lot of the people in his audience are girls that are in love with him. Where yeah. Eric Clapton knows most of the people in his audience respect are in love him. with him. <laughs> they're in love with him in a different way, right? Yeah. They, they're in love with him, not that they want to go have babies with him, but they, they know this guy's the best guitarist alive today, arguably. Yeah. So what does he do? He comes out and goes, this is what you're here for. Where Robbie Williams goes, more than half of you are probably here for this. So I'm going to take my shirt off and do my thing. Yeah. You know, it's knowing your character and your audience. And it's a great example of both. Uh, yeah. And I think we as magicians can do the exact same thing. If you are an unbelievably skilled manipulator, why not walk out on stage where it's dark black, a little ghostly music plays, and then one spotlight comes on and it's you doing your thing, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a comedy magician, you're going to have to walk out and win them over with your words and things. And it's it's a good example of that, but in a rock star setting. So um, that that kind of sums up chapters five and six. We are trying to keep Absolutely. these a little bit shorter so they're more palpable. And we're going to be doing two chapters at a time unless we feel one chapter has so much meat and potato in it that we've got to focus on it. But if you keep watching, you'll see how we structure it. And we hope you're taking away some content from this. As always, please do throw some comments down there. If there's anything you want to hear or learn about specifically, let us know. You know, we're here to, to really try and help you guys and girls become the best performers possible and for ourselves to learn along the way as well. So thanks for your time. We'll see you on the next one.